Hello and welcome to the Charles River Conservancy Parkland Show. My name is Renata von Charner and today we're talking about the essence of the Charles River, that's the water. And with me today is Bob Zimmerman, the Executive Director of the Charles River Watershed Association. Welcome Bob. Thank you. The Charles River Watershed Association is an organization that covers um, not just the urban parklands, but the entire watershed. So you have seen this map before because that is the area where the Charles River Conservancy works, where we do our volunteer events with the 2000 volunteers a year, where we do bike paths and the skate park and the Sunday games. Um, but the Watershed Association works on the entire watershed, which is this green area. It's called here the Charles River Basin, but um, Bob will explain to us um, what, what this area does for the Charles River. And the area uh, which is horizontal, which is the first 10 miles, that's the area where the Conservancy works, but the Watershed Association works on the entire 80 miles in the watershed. Um, so Bob, you have been executive director since 1991 and the organization already existed before you joined them. Yeah, the organization has been around since 1965. Since 65. So if you could give us an overview of um, what, what you're working on now, or maybe a bit of the history of how this all, how the Watershed Association started. CRWA is um, a unique uh, regional environmental organization. We're a, an environmental research and advocacy organization. We do a lot of science, a lot of engineering, uh, to try to understand how the river works and uh, how to fix it, basically. Uh, a lot of studies on uh, what it was like 300 years ago and what we've done to interfere with natural systems and how without uh, causing Boston and Cambridge to disappear, uh, how to restore uh, the river to a more natural state. What do you mean? Not to have them disappear, what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, it's going to be hard to take all the buildings down, but they I do see. interfere with rainfall and groundwater and that sort of thing. So you mean uh, how the ground could behave as if the buildings weren't here? Right. right. So okay. the, the notion is to make rainwater and groundwater and the river itself behave as if we'd never built these cities. All right. All right. So you have a very a dramatic picture here of um, at the Science Museum. Did you when this is is that a recent picture or? This is uh, I believe 1988. Uh, this is down at the Museum of Science, and this is after what's called a combined sewer overflow, which we used to get 28 of uh, a year on average. Um, not an area where you want to go swimming. That's uh, raw sewage and uh, detritus uh, floating around in the lower basin. Um, not a good thing. We also used to suffer from, uh, this is a storm drain, and when it's not raining, and you can see that it's not raining here, uh, that storm drain should not be running. What that means is that there is, uh, or was, an illegal cross connection, it's called, where somebody's residence or a building, a commercial enterprise was hooked up to the wrong pipe in the ground and every time it ran the sinks or flushed the toilet, that water went directly out to the river. Mm -hmm. Now, um, th these are all not very pleasant experiences and um, there is going to be a swim, um, a community swim, and you will be there, the Conservancy will be there, it will be a historic event. So obviously things have changed a bit. Yes, uh, you could have seen the combined sewer overflow results and these kinds of cross connections uh, as recently as 1995, 96, 97. Things were still um, not very good. So when, when Governor Wilt jumped in, things were still pretty bad. As a matter of fact, we were sampling that day and uh, we would have advised him not to jump in that day, <laughs> as a matter of fact, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, here you, um, this is a chart of how things have improved. So this was um, explained what the boat and the swimming, what the standards are of how they differ. So for bacteria, and that's what uh, these percentiles are for, for bacteria effectively um, uh, greater than a, uh, 
uh, a thousand uh, units per one liter of water is meet or less than one thousand units per uh, a liter of water meets boating standards. That's where you get splashed secondarily, and the swimming standard is set at two hundred mm -hmm. uh, units. Uh, so in 1995, a very concerted effort, based on our science, the monitoring we started um, in uh, fir first time was in fall of 1994. But uh, John De Villers, who was the regional administrator at EPA uh, in the summer of 1995, uh, started an effort to clean up the discharge of raw sewage to the river. That's and when he declared what is the Swimmable Charles Initiative. Right, Fishable Swimmable yep. Charles. Um, and he gave us 10 years to uh, get to that goal. We did, he did, uh, Boston Water and Sewer, Cambridge Department of Public Works uh, did a fine job over the ensuing three or four years in cleaning up combined sewer overflows mm -hmm. and <clears throat> illegal cross connections. So uh, the last year we show here is, <clears throat> excuse me, 2000. Uh, and unfortunately we seem to be stuck at about the year mm. 2000. Uh, we meet the boating standard in the lower basin uh, between 90 and 100% of the time. So that's a, a thousand uh, units per uh, liter of water. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, the swimming standard has been more difficult to uh, obtain. We, we're in that range of swimmable between 60 and 70 percent of the time most every year. So we we'll keep our fingers crossed for, for the community to swim. Right. Um, now um, the MWRA also obviously plays a key role um, in, in that effort. Um, maybe you can explain how, how, what the role they play. Well, they manage the uh, wastewater system, and this uh, slide shows, the, the red lines there show the piping system that serves the 43 communities that are in the MWRA wastewater system. Um, and the reason we have this slide in is, <laughs> if you flick to the next one, um, this represents the total amount of water uh, treated uh, over the course of a year at uh, the, the MWRA Deer Island Wastewater Treatment Plant. And the key here is that the red uh, on the bottom is the actual wastewater that's being sent out to Deer that Island. That should be going there. That should be going out to Deer Island. The two blues, the light blue, is groundwater leaking into the system. That definitely shouldn't be there. It shouldn't going be there. there. No. And the reason that happens is that a pipe in the ground, the pressure inside the pipe is much lower than the pressure in the ground that surrounds it. Mm -hmm. So that water can only move in the ground a foot to a foot and a half a day. Inside the pipe, it can move tens of miles Sounds in a like day. Sounds like a freeway. Right. So if there's a fissure in the pipe, then uh, the water leaks into the pipe. Uh, and as a consequence, virtually 50% of the uh, water treated at Deer Island is otherwise potable groundwater that belongs in our rivers and streams. Which is also a waste. In, a complete waste. waste, waste. Of that. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, going out to Deer Island. And the dark blue represents uh, rainwater uh, getting into the system. So we don't really want either the dark blue or the light blue. <gasps> the rainwater and the groundwater getting into the system because yeah. it causes all kinds of other problems. Yeah. Uh, let's look at the where that, um, how the, the, the sewage that should be in there, where it's coming from. This is the, the chart that shows that. Well, um, once we address the major sewage issues, the, the number one source of pollution remaining to the Charles is stormwater which makes it sound like it's the rain's fault that it got dirty when it shunts off the land. Uh, it's not the rain's fault. Rain is uh, pretty clean. Uh, there's some trace pollutants in it, but it's when it hits the land and then runs off and goes to the storm drain in the side of the street, and from there goes directly out to the river that we have problems. So CRWA did a study, uh, what's called a loading analysis. And if you look on the slide on the on the right hand side of the pie chart, pay close attention to uh, land use. So 3% of the total land use in the Charles is commercial, 5% is industrial, and 12% is uh, high density residential. If you flick to the next chart, notice that commercial, industrial, and high density residential 
for the pollutant, a nutrient, phosphorus, uh, running off to the river, represents 50% mm. of the total daily load in the river. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. That means we have to somehow slow down uh, and capture the phosphorus and runoff from parking lots, which is the number one cause of this problem, um, and uh, clean that up, get the water back in the ground. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're going to lose the river. Mm -hmm. In fact, the river now is dying. It, uh, the weed growth, if um, uh, left alone for the next 30, 40 years, uh, would grow in and the Charles would turn into a big swamp uh, for most, most of its course. We don't think that's a, a, a good desirable. outcome, no. a desirable outcome. So we've been working with EPA on ways of uh, uh, collecting and uh, treating that stormwater. And we have some pictures here as to how. All right. So maybe what, what, what you want to talk about next is in a way of, of how you apply that knowledge to actual areas of, of what so some of the solutions are that you propose to do, uh, address that. So um, I'm sure most of your audience is familiar with the term green infrastructure, the notion of introducing rain gardens and swales, sort of natural systems, to capture runoff from parking lots and allow it to infiltrate into the ground, which would eliminate the phosphorus problem and actually enhance water quality in the river. Um, one of the things that we've been doing over the last decade, dec decade and a half, is to uh, take land in Boston, and uh, we haven't done Cambridge yet, although we're, we're certainly looking to do that. This is uh, the, the uh, Alston, uh, Brighton area uh, of the river. Mm -hmm. And the red lines indicate what we call storm sewer sheds. The little uh, green triangles are outfalls to the river so that water collected off pavement and uh, going into pipes ends up dumping into the river at those um, uh, outfalls, those green triangles. Uh, and then we overlaid this same infrastructure over what the Charles was like in 1903 before the construction of the Museum of Science Dam in 1908. And you can see here that most of that area used to be tidal estuary. And if you look very closely, I'm sure your viewers can't see it, but there are a couple of creeks in there mm. uh, that ran all of the time. So one of the things that we did was to conceptually uh, imagine what we might do if we were to reconnect the rainwater to the ground uh, through green infrastructure and then um, uh, rebuild what they call daylight, uh, the term of art, rebuild the creeks and um, uh, the natural systems, and even though we still have Boston. We have Boston. So you kind of make it easier for the water to get back and for the water that goes into the ground to be not to go into into the island. Right. In effect, yeah. re restoring uh, uh, or mimicking natural systems. Mm -hmm. I think if you go to the next slide, <clears throat> there's a picture here. This is behind uh, the Honan Library in Alston. Uh, there at the top and on the uh, right hand side, you can see a map uh, depicting the area. On top is what it looks like now. But underneath there, this creek uh, runs. So there's a, uh, is it in a culvert or it's, just? Yeah, it's, it's in a storm in, drain. In a storm drain, yeah. So, the, uh, you know, it's constantly running directly out to the river. And this is what it would look like if you go to the next slide. This is a conceptual view of what it might look like were we to take that creek out of the pipe and restore the connections from pavement uh, by putting in rain gardens and the like, capturing rainwater mm -hmm. and allowing it to move uh, through the ground and to the creek as flow. Mm -hmm. This, this um, daylighting effort is, I understand, also going on on the former parking lot of the old Sears building um, in the Fenway. Right. That was all paved over and then first they removed the parking lot and now they are actually opening up to let the muddy river be in the daylight again. Right. Is, would that be a similar, a That's similar a, approach? Exactly the same thing. The idea is that a, a, a creek or a river in a pipe uh, is uh, gone and as a consequence it tends to get polluted because we don't pay any attention to it. Mm -hmm. By bringing it back to the surface, uh, people pay attention to it. They want to see it clean and they want to see fish in it, uh, you know, a more natural environment. Besides which, it's far more inviting to all of us. You know, uh, our depiction here has 
mom and kids and uh, bicyclers and the like. Mm -hmm. This is very possible. Yeah. Um, if you go to the next slide, we'll show, um, this is uh, looking from the river into the Harvard Business School. And uh, the creek would run uh, through the back of the Harvard Business School. And the next slide shows a conception of what it might look like if it were taken out of the ground and a wetland area were put in there to help further clean the, uh, the water before it went into the river. So um, what we see in the, in, the, in the rendering is some wetland but also some flowing water um, that would be parallel to the path. So exactly you, right. Bringing the water up. We even put in our favorite um, great blue heron, if you look closely <laughs> yeah. there. His name is Henry. He's a great guy. He's a great guy. Well, <laughs> they're definitely, um, there's so many more because probably there are more fish, so there's more, there's yeah. more reason for them to come back. That's a good thing. Yeah. Um, but the fish um, that flow in the river, would you, would you eat the fish? Uh, no. No, so people should not eat the fish. Uh, we would recommend not. It's not so much because of the pollutants in the Charles, it's because of uh, atmospheric deposition of mercury. The entire state of Massachusetts has a fish advisory uh, uh, for mercury contamination. Uh, you shouldn't be eating fish more than uh, from the rivers more than once a month. All right. Okay. Well, that's because yeah, I know the Charles River was written up in the fishing magazine and they did not mention that aspect. So that, this is a, a, a warning. If oh. you go to the next slide here, you'll see this is uh, an area in Alston which looks very much like many areas around Cambridge and Boston. Um, and as you can see, it's all pavement and all runoff. And this is a rendering of what it might look like if it were uh, reconstructed, restored to work better with water, to capture the water uh, like in a natural uh, state where most of the water goes into the ground or is taken up by plant life. Mm -hmm. So, so these, the plants on the right and left, they serve as swales and make it easier for them. Right. They're actually yeah. lower than the pavement, so the water runs off the pavement into those areas and, and is collected there. Yeah. And I think we have another detail of, of how it's done. <clears throat> this is an actual installation. Um, we designed, I don't know, maybe five years ago, four years ago, um, Peabody Square in Dorchester. Uh, we worked with niche engineering and uh, this installation is actually there. This is a picture of uh, what it looks like. Uh, the idea is to take the water from uh, the surrounding uh, pavement, what we call impervious cover, uh, and treat it and uh, allow it to infiltrate back into the ground. The nice thing about this is that although it only took us about four months to design this and maybe two and a half years to permit it, <laughs> if you go to the next slide, right. um, that permitting process uh, allowed us to talk to uh, the Boston Transportation Department, the Boston Water and Sewer Commission, uh, Boston De Department of Environment and the like, and they have come out with complete street guidelines. So whenever they redo a street now, they're looking to install the same sorts of um, green infrastructure, mm -hmm. which will slow water down, which will get it back into the ground. It also does wonderful things like help prevent flash flooding, you know, as our storms become more powerful with climate change. It's a good way to calm the water down mm -hmm. and um, basically restore or mimic mm -hmm. uh, more natural mm -hmm. systems. Maybe we can go back to that image of the complete streets in a moment. We, we actually, um, one of your staff, Halavi, she helped us with, with the skate park. There's going to be, in a way, it's a complete skate park in the sense it, it will have swales and and um, areas where with plants where the water will be captured so that um, it functions better than uh, a skate park would normally function. A big so, hunk of concrete. That's a good yeah, idea. Exactly. Excellent. So um, maybe you want to um, explain some of the elements of the complete street, particularly as it pertains to water. What are the components in a street that ideally you want to see? Well, first of all, um, your viewers might imagine any kind of hotel parking lot or uh, parking lot they've been in where there are the uh, these islands that they park up against, which tend to be above the parking lot, mm -hmm. right, with mm -hmm. trees in them, mm -hmm. which means that they have to be watered uh, with uh, potable water, unfortunately. The notion is to actually lower those same island areas below the parking lot level mm -hmm. and allow the runoff to run into and get collected there. 
where plants are introduced that mm -hmm. do a good mm -hmm. job of taking mm -hmm. up nitrates and phosphorus mm -hmm. and allowing the rest of the water to infiltrate back into the ground. The other nice thing about these installations is that you get a lot more street trees, yeah. which uh, help um, with climate change by uh, bringing down what's called heat island effect. Mm. That is the sun shining directly on the pavement and heating it up with the trees, you get shade, it helps reduce the, uh, the need for air conditioning uh, over the course of a summer. I think there's a good example of that on the Charles as part of community rowing. I think you were involved in advising them of how they could create swales and make the parking lot there. Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, all of the uh, runoff from the parking lot at CRI does run off into swales and is collected and uh, treated before it's mm -hmm. and then it moves through the ground like it would have 300 years ago and comes back up uh, uh, as recharge mm -hmm. it's called as flow to the river mm -hmm. and i remember some legislation that was proposed that all parking areas that are larger in a certain acreage should allow that and that was you were very much a proponent of that and it was fought by um, some other groups because they felt it's going to be too expensive and you showed how much that it wouldn't actually wouldn't be that expensive. That was We've actually uh, built, um, I forget, 10 or 13 of these installations specifically to, to uh, pre-test uh, the water, uh, pre-construction test the water and figure out what's in it and then put the installation in and then post-construction test and see if we're achieving and also to do uh, work on figuring out how much all of this will cost. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of ways to bring down the cost of these installations. Uh, we're uh, certainly highly aware, acutely aware, of uh, the economic ramifications. So we're looking at what we call Blue Cities Exchange. It's a stormwater trading program mm -hmm. that would allow those who can install these systems cheaply to trade with those that mm. uh, would find uh, uh, creating remediation very expensive. So is that uh, modeled after the carbon trading? Is it, well, yeah, it's a, it's a uh, strictly a cap and trade uh, mm -hmm. process, um, and we're in the early stages of doing that. We were in negotiations with EPA, I think, for five or six years mm. on what they call residual designation. That is extending their permitting authority to stormwater runoff because it is a, a major source of pollution, not only to the Charles River, but to every river in the United States. Yeah. Uh, and we have to figure out a way to address this for all kinds of reasons, not just pollution and not just restoring the Charles, but also dealing with flash flooding. Mm -hmm. We're getting a lot more flash flooding and that will continue. It's gonna get worse every year with climate change. Uh, Massachusetts is slated to get much more rainfall as much as uh, 40 or 50 percent more than we currently get mm -hmm. as soon as um, 20 to 25 years. Now there's a great deal of uncertainty in those numbers. Nevertheless, it behooves us to pay attention and, and uh, yeah. start to do something about yeah. it. Well, it's, it's great to have you and to have the Charles River Watershed Association work on that because um, Cambridge, which is downriver um, from these 80 miles, greatly benefits from that. And you have, I think, also a list of um, of other um, projects that you're working on. Maybe you want to just go over that list to give an overview of some of the projects, some of them you talked about, and others um, we haven't had a chance to talk about it. Well, the Blue Cities is the uh, green infrastructure. That's the whole notion of uh, testing and installing uh, remediation systems to capture stormwater and get it back in the ground. Blue Cities National, uh, we're working with a group called River Network, which is a national alliance of about 800 groups, uh, water groups across the nation, to take some of the science that we've developed and the methodologies we, we've developed. So we've worked in Michigan and in Kentucky so far. Um, uh, the residual designation is the actual uh, phosphorus regulation to try to get control of the phosphorus from commercial, industrial, and high density residential properties. And you'll see that roll out uh, across the Charles over the next uh, two to three years. Uh, we wanna do that slowly because we wanna make sure that we get the economics right, that we um, make it as cheap as possible, um, and that we optimize uh, installation. Mm -hmm. uh, stormwater trading factors into that. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we're also looking at what we call smart sewering. Remember that uh, picture depicting all of the groundwater and rainwater leaking into the pipes? Mm -hmm. Well, it'd be a good idea if that didn't leak into the pipes. And one of the things that we're looking at are the economics of decentralizing over time, over say 20, 25 years, mm -hmm. the Deer Island Wastewater Treatment Plant and doing it in such a way that we're generating energy with the organics in, in sewage, mm -hmm. uh, producing industrial reuse water and putting the infiltration portion of the water that's captured in those pipes back in the ground. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, yeah, I only have about one minute left, so we'll have, I'm rushing you through the last <laughs> two there. Uh, well, we continue to monitor the river and uh, continue to try to figure out what the best things to do are. And yeah. we have a new thing. We, we won the International River Prize yeah. a couple of years ago. And we're currently working in the Dominican Republic on what they call twinning. Um, oh, that's what that is. Yeah. And, and, uh, and something that um, people in Cambridge might be familiar with is the flags that are can be seen along the river. And that is your water testing program where people can see if the water is potable. Right. Um, and on your website, people can see if it's swimmable. Right. So I want to thank you for the wonderful work you do and for coming today. And this show will be on YouTube if you missed it. And um, and I, the next image will will show us the website that where you can get information about the CRWA. And thank you very much for coming today. Thank you. It's fun. How do we do?